Jay Blakesburg, one of the United States' most respected and talented rock and roll and pop culture photographers, has released yet another self-published book called Retro Blakesburg, Volume 1, The Film Archives. It spans the decades of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the early 2000s when film was king, when a photographer was a real photographer before the digital age. The book talks about his beginnings and the sale of his first photograph for $15 and his tours with Fish and shooting photographs with Led Zeppelin, Neil Young, Green Day, Flaming Lips, Snoop Dogg, Primus, tons of the Grateful Dead. I'd seen Jay's photographs before, but first became acquainted with his unique style in February of 2022 at Mohegan Sun Arena in Connecticut on stage with a band I've grown pretty damn fond of named Goose. As it turns out, Jay was there to capture the drummer, Ben Atkind, proposing to his girlfriend on stage after the second set in front of 10,000 fans. And there I saw Jay getting the perfect shot. Hmm, I thought, I gotta reach out to that guy. I wonder what his name is. Here's my interview with Jay Blakes. At Goosemas, where you first saw me, which was a, a holiday show um, that was postponed because of COVID from the holidays to the spring of 2022. I was there, uh, if you'll remember, Ben, the drummer, um, proposed to his uh, girlfriend, now his fiance, on stage at the end of, I think, the first set or the second set. Yeah. And Ben and, and I had become friends over the last couple of years. And he said, will you come out to Connecticut and get the shot for me? Get get that shot of me proposing to Sam. And Sam's also become a dear friend. And, you know, before they got engaged, when they were really early in their relationship, the three of us had gone out to dinner once. And, uh, you know, I just love those guys to pieces. So I said, of course, I'd love to be there for that moment for you. Uh, but that's not what we came to talk about. We came yeah. to talk about Retro Blakesburg, which yeah. is my new book. And all this film talk and digital talk is because... Retro Blakesburg is based on an Instagram page that my daughter started during the pandemic called Retro Blakesburg. And she said, came to me one day and said, can we do a book called Retro Blakesburg? And the premise is that everything in that book and everything on that Instagram page is shot on film. And whereas I have my own Instagram page called J Blakesburg and I post goose that I shot last month and, you know, whatever it might be, but that's, you know, I, I post things I shot on film. I post things that I shot digitally. I post things that I shoot with my phone, you know, whatever it might be. It's just sort of like my ongoing blog. Whereas retro Blakesburg is curated by my daughter. I don't have much say into what she posts or when she posts or how she posts. And, uh, and then we started on the book. She curated the book. You know, she, she said, no, I'm not putting that. I'm not putting that stupid fucking image in there. What are you fucking crazy? You know, like that kind of stuff. And so I'd be like, okay, you're the boss. Leave me alone. Yeah. You, you, you raised a, a strong willed, confident young woman. It sounds yes. like. Yeah. So Ricky is in, very much involved in, in all of my projects right now, Retro Blakesburg. And, uh, and then on top of the Retro Blakesburg book, which is even more exciting, is I have my actual, actually have my first um, solo museum exhibition. Uh, and it's coming up in October and that's called Retro Blakesburg Captured on Film 1978-2008. And again, it's all things that are shot only on film. And that's at the Morris Museum in Morristown, New Jersey. And that's a Smithsonian affiliate museum, the only, only Smithsonian affiliate New museum in New Jersey. And it's 20 miles away from where I grew up and where some of these early photos that are in the Retro Blakesburg book were taken. So it's pretty a big honor for me to have been asked to do this um, uh, museum exhibit. And so the book and the, and the museum exhibit are all sort of tied together in, uh, in one big offering of you know, what I've been doing for the last 44 years. Um, you know, taking pictures, although it stops in 2008. So really it's 78 to 2008. So it's really 30 years of my 44 years, but I have my 44 years of eyes and experience helping curate that stuff with my daughter and working on that and, and oh, yeah. uh, making sure that those film images are scanned properly and retouched properly and, and, uh, you know, proper exposure and color and all that and getting it out there. So, you know, Jay, one of the things that 
I'm constantly drawn to when I talk to somebody that I've never met before, even people I know, is what sparked a passion in them and what got them to pursue their craft. And, and I love that, that moment in time, and it might be several moments, when somebody feels a spark and they realize, I don't care how many couches I have to sleep on or how long it takes me, but I want to be Jay Blakesburg. I want to be a rock and roll photographer. And you found a love of that really early. So you're 16 years old, you published your first photograph. So you had this spark and you just honed in on it. And, um, that's a beautiful story. And I just kind of talk a little bit about that, about finding something you loved and sticking with it. Nope, not going to get a job and do the normal thing. Right. Well, you hit the nail on the head in a lot of different places. Um, so I do public speaking also, and I do a, a couple of different slideshows and talk about, you know, I do a Grateful Dead slideshow. I do a, a more broad slideshow. I'm going to create a new one for Retro Blakesburg. And one of the things that I talk about in my slideshow is really what you were just saying, which is that, you know, when you're 15 or 16 years old, 17 years old, really all you have are your hopes and your dreams, right? And you don't even know what they are, what they mean, how to achieve them, how to tap into them. And so when I started taking photographs with a camera that I borrowed from my dad, um, it turned me on and it did, it, it did ignite a spark and, and, and I did have some passion for it, right? but I didn't know how to harness that passion. I didn't know how to harness that spark, but all these little things happen that sort of take that spark and turn it into a little flame and a bigger flame and a bigger flame. And so, you know, for me, some of the key things were uh, in May of 78, um, we followed Yorma's limousine from New Jersey to New York City after a Yorma concert at the Capitol Theater. And I got a photograph of him that I sent to the letters of the uh, uh, letters to the editor of Relics Magazine and they published it. And, you know, back then, you know, getting published in print, let alone a magazine that you read cover to cover every issue was like pretty mega for a 16 years old, 16 year old. And then uh, when I was 17, uh, the Aquarian Weekly, which is a free weekly newspaper in New Jersey, published two photos of mine in a review of a dead show. I was 17 years old and I got paid $15 for two photos and it takes that spark and it makes it a little bit bigger and the flame gets a little bit bigger. And, you know, there's just different things that happen. But I remember one time I was up in upstate New York and there's in the retro Blakesburg book, there's a whole bunch of photos that were taken and are in the book that are from upstate New York. One of my best friends from high school moved away south at the end of sophomore year. And we used to drive up there the three, four hours on some weekends, a few weekends in the fall and the spring and, and, you know, do stupid things like, cause we live by the creative adolescent stupidity. How much dumb stuff can you do to try and kill yourself without really realizing we were trying to kill ourselves yeah. but we're lucky we're still alive as are many people we know from that era and i remember um sh getting like having a roll of film that was developed either at a lab or my basement or whatever it was and i remember showing it to my friend tommy i'm like look at this negative look at this cool shot and he's looking at this negative and his eyeballs are rolling around in his head and he couldn't process it like it meant nothing to him it was just like a piece of film that had things on it dyes and colors or you know silver or whatever it was and to me, I was like all spun out at how fucking cool it was. Right. And I remember that day, like he's, um, he's like, he just couldn't like, and most people don't feel, you know, like don't feel that way. So when we used to shoot film, um, when we got our film back from the lab, it turned us on, man. Like it turned me on. Like, I mean, when I got my jobs back from the lab and I was like, Oh my God, this is, this is killer. This is great. It's in focus. It's exposed properly. It's, it's a great emotion. It's a great shot. It's a great, you know, image of a deadhead of Jerry, of, of David Bowie, of, you know, Soundgarden, of Pearl Jam, Nirvana, whatever it might be, you know, like I was turned on and I still get turned on when I take these photographs and I look at them on the back of my camera on the viewfinder, which is a terrible habit. Um, and I'm like, Ooh, cool. But when I bring them into my computer and I see them on this 27 inch monitor, I'm like, yeah, man, like I dig this shit. Like it still turns me on. And really what it comes down to are those is that what you said is the passion, but there's another really, really key element to all of it. And that's the inspiration, right? And the inspiration for me happens with what's in front of my lens. So if I'm shooting deadheads dancing or hippies dancing, um, you know, I was just recently at the Oregon Country Fair and I was shooting these, you know, hippies having fun. And these are people, some of these people I've known for 30 and 40 years. 
you know, so they're my friends and they were still grooving together and I'm still documenting it. And it still turns me on to like import the stuff. And I'm like, I can't wait to edit it and process it in the computer and export it and put it on Instagram or social media and share it because, you know, there's also that whole dopamine rush of people looking at it and commenting on it and having it relate to their lives. And so, you know, essentially, um, you know, these people and these experiences and these scenarios that I put myself in are my muse, right? Whether it's a hippie chick dancing or a guy hippie dude dancing or a band playing on stage or traveling to Morocco, like I did a couple of months ago and shooting street photography, you know, in a foreign country. Um, and so all of those things, um, they still fucking turn me on and they, they inspire me and, and, uh, um, and it, and it, and it creates that burning passion. And so it's all of those things combined, you know, that spark turned into an inferno long ago, you know, doing assignments for Rolling Stone magazine. I shot, shot regular assignments for them for 30 years. Um, you know, so shooting for Rolling Stone and shooting covers for guitar player magazine and relics magazine and working with art directors and working with models and working with bands and working with record companies, you know, I mean, the, there's a new Neil Young album coming out in August. I have the cover photo, right? And, you know, just found this out like about a week ago. I, you oh. know, they that they oh. they told me and, and announced it. And it's a live shot of Neil taken at the Greek Theater here in Berkeley a few years ago. It's a live record that he played with, you know, Lucas Nelson and Promise of the Real. And that's still like to me, I'm like, fuck yeah, man. I got a cover of a fucking Neil Young record. Like, you know. Yeah. So there still is like all of that push, that drive, that inspiration. So in that, like you in in the book, you break your book down into decades, essentially 70s. And, and it's really easy for me to read because we're we grew up, went to high school, graduated to high school the same year. Northeast. I'm a New England guy, but following probably the same bands and everything. Yeah, and, having uh, similar experiences. And, you know, the one thing is, is neither of us had cell phones. We didn't uh, have the Internet. You uh, know, we yeah. just had our turntables in the radio and our That's friends. It. That's what it was. The, the idea of going up into my bedroom at the end of the day or after school, putting on tunes. So that said, what is your when, when you go to a show? I don't know if you have any signature kind of shots, you know, and I've noticed you you were behind the guy in the middle of the stage looking it essentially through him and people adoring him in the crowd but uh do you have a plan or do you just go with the feel is it different with the flow so um the best advice i ever got for taking a photo at a concert was from my little league coach when i was 10 years old and he basically said anticipate the play no matter where you are in the in the outfield so if you're a baseball person you'll understand this right so if if you're playing second base in the field and there's a man on first and a ground ball is hit to you you throw the ball to second base to get the lead out maybe get a double play but if you're the left fielder and there's a drop line drive hit to you that and there's a man on first you get it you throw it to the shortstop to cut off the runner from going to third so no matter where you are in the field everybody has a different play that they have to make if the play comes to them so you have to anticipate the play right and that works for when you're shooting rock and roll right you mm. you know the music you know the peaks you know the valleys you know the lyrics you know the moments and so you you've got to be you got to wait for it right, right. Uh, so you know anticipate the play really is is the is the key um, right, and be right. ready and not have a beer or a cigarette or a joint in your hand and have your camera close by and ready to fucking rock and roll, man. So did you keep all your old gear? Were you a wide angle lens guy? In, in that you've got, let's say on a good day, if you, if you thread the film right, you got 34 exposures or 36 exposures and you go click, 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 click. Now on a digital, you can just hold the button down and shoot a hundred in about two seconds. So it's a diff. It's really different. It, it, yeah. does, did that change your style? Uh, yes and no. So a couple of things. Uh, yes, I am a wide angle guy. Yeah. Always, always have been. And the reason for that is, in order to get a good picture, you got to be right next to the person you're shooting. Mm -hmm. I have a photographer friend who used to always shoot with a 300 millimeter lens when he was allowed in the photo pit. 
and he would go back a little bit further and he liked that compression and he liked that shallow depth of field. And I was right on top of that person with a 24 millimeter lens or a 35 millimeter lens because I like to be in their face. So when I was a film shooter, I was always a way heavier shooter than most other people. Like I can remember back in the day when I only got three songs uh, in a photo pit and we'd walk out at the end of three songs and, you know, somebody would say, how many rolls of film do you shoot? And I'd be like 10 and they'd be like, what? And then I'd be like, how much you shoot? They're like one and a half. And so this is my philosophy is that if I'm at the Fillmore in 1996 in San Francisco and I'm shooting the Foo Fighters on December 11th, 1996, I don't know if that's the date, I will never for the rest of time be at the Fillmore on December 11th, 1996, shooting the Foo Fighters. So if I can shoot 10 rolls of film, I'm going to shoot 10 rolls of film. That was my philosophy. And that has done me very, very well. And I'm not saying that it's because I have quantity, but it's a combination of quantity and quality. And so, uh, you know, there's somebody that might just be like, hey, I got one good shot, you know, but I might get 10 good shots or 20 good shots because I'm shooting 10 times as much as the, the person next to me is shooting. And, uh, and the other thing is, is that 99% of the time, I was on assignment from a magazine or a record company and they were paying for my film and processing anyway. And I owned it so I could shoot as much as I want and oh, then keep it, you know? Yeah. So that's why I was always a heavy film shooter. And then digital came along. You think I was a heavy film shooter? I might shoot three or 400 rolls, 300 or 400 frames at a concert. You know, most concerts now that I'm shooting and that's in three songs, most concerts now that I'm shooting a whole show, uh, I'm shooting anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 images. So, but, you know, going back to the book, Retro Blakesburg, you can sort of, sort of also see an evolution, like you said, at 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. And uh, there's an essay that I wrote at the beginning of each chapter that sort of talks about what I was working on and, you know, where my mindset was and uh, how I worked as a creative person and who I was working with. So all of those things are talked about in this book and you can sort of see the evolution of me going from a kid with a camera to a flash on my camera doing snapshots to actually creating interesting photographs to learning how to develop my craft and develop my style and my vibe to um, um, you know making it work for me on a commercial level um, and um, you know moving forward creatively to create interesting photographs that hopefully uh, inspire other people and other photographers and, and even just the people that are looking at them in the book to, to walk away with something. You know, I get a lot of comments. Uh, you know, the cover of the book is a picture of a woman uh, taken at the Rainbow Gathering in 1984. And looking at this particular photograph and the way that everybody's dressed, this probably could be 1974, 6, 84, 94. 2004, huh. 2014, uh, you know, and so I, I'm trying to create images that are timeless, but also photographs that take you back to that time. So you're looking at the book and if you're our age and you look at these photographs from the 1970s, you're most likely going to think that was my life. I hung out with that dude with the bandana on his head. Like that's who, you know, those were my people. We smoked weed. We did bong hits. We got fucked up on alcohol and weed and, and, and stumbled around our parents' houses to hide it from them so that they didn't, you know, put us in the mental institution because we smoked pot because back then that's what people thought. You're smoking marijuana. You must go to the mental institution. Um, and uh, so uh, I think the book, I, I like to call my the new book um, Retro Blakesburg and a visual autobiography, right? You know, people have asked me, when are you going to tell your story? And I did, you know, there's about, I wrote about 40, uh, 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 no, I wrote about, there's four essays. I wrote about 10,000 words in the book. There's about 10,000 words in this book that I wrote. So that's like a really couple of long, long magazine articles. But I, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to share how I, how I felt, what I was doing, what was inspiring me, where I was, uh, the trials and tribulations of being a kid, trying to figure out his place in the script and growing up and um, seeing the Grateful Dead and you know, and then getting a chance to work with the Grateful Dead and seeing Santana and getting to work with Santana, um, you know, things like that. So I've been very, very blessed. Um, and there's, you know, there's photographs in there of, 
Nirvana and Pearl Jam and the Chili Peppers and Jane's Addiction and the Butthole Surfers, but there's also pictures of Neil Young and Joni Mitchell and Radiohead and the Flaming Lips. And speaking of the Flaming Lips, you know, Wayne Coyne, the lead singer of the Flaming Lips, he wrote the foreword for the book. And yeah. Michael Fronte and, uh, uh, from the band Spearhead, uh, dear friend for over 30 years now, both of them, Wayne and Michael. I, I first shot Wayne Coyne and the Flaming Lips in 1989 and I first shot Michael Fronty in his band back then, the Beatniks, in 1987. So I've got a 35-year relationship with Michael and a 32, 33-year relationship with Wayne. And so Michael wrote the introduction. Wayne wrote the forward. And um, I love what they wrote, you know. And then there's my essay. And then my daughter, who curated it, wrote a short essay. And uh, I think there's a lot of information, both visually and um, uh, in the written word, and it's not something that you could get bogged down with. You know, you could probably read the whole entire thing in one sitting of, you know, an hour or two. Yeah. And uh, and I want people to see how my career evolved, how my life evolved, how I got from point A to point B to point C and uh, how I ended up here. And, and so I, you know, this is not a book about the Grateful Dead. It's not a book about one particular artist. It's about my experience and photographing all of those artists because they're all in the book. Right. Um, it's not just a Jerry Garcia book, which is my last book. And for those of you guys looking to buy a book, if you want to order a signed copy directly from me, you can just go to rockoutbooks.com. And uh, so, you know, we live, eat and breathe um, photography here in the studio and, and love every minute of it. It's all inspiring, um, you know, sometimes a little bit overwhelming, but it's it's I, I love it. I'm happy that I get to do it. I feel very fortunate that this is my life that I created. I took that little tiny spark and turned into a little flame and a bigger flame and, and uh, you know, a fire, a forest fire without hurting anybody, you yeah. know, no trees, no trees were harmed in this, in this forest fire.